Jen. Hello. Hi, um, really excited to talk about your book today. Uh, this is Jen's new book, Goblins, which is published by Rough Trade Books. And it looks a little bit like this. Um, congratulations. How are you feeling about the publication? Um, I feel really excited about it, but it is quite a personal piece of writing. I think um, I put in a lot of stuff that I've carried around with me for many years. That I've always thought I will never tell anyone or write any of this down and then I seem to have put it all in this little book um so that was a bit nerve-wracking I suppose but yeah really glad it's out there yeah I completely understand that must be really nerve-wracking and it's yeah I mean brave is like a horribly overused word but I think it is quite brave to put this stuff into the world and kind of not know what reaction you're going to get but I think that's part of what makes the book so exciting that it just feels like someone who's kind of at the edge like pushing on the edge of their practice and kind of pushing on the edge of their sort of understanding of the world which is quite exciting for me as a reader um something that I wanted to kind of ask you about which sort of ties into what you just said is you know there are so many different themes in this book and that's what makes it so interesting but something that really struck me is the statement that there is at the beginning this quote which says a goblin has no shame and that's obviously something that kind of moves throughout the entire book and I just wondered why did you want to write about shame and shamelessness because I think shamelessness is equally important through the monstrous lens what is it about kind of bringing goblins and monsters and sort of the fantastical that allowed you to talk about those things in a way that kind of felt right to you yeah I think it comes from that dichotomy maybe that we're all brought up with around good and evil and how that is also often gendered and around gender different kinds of behavior yeah. and I think um, it stemmed from seeing that the things we were told were evil and wrong and dirty um, and something that we should not aspire to were characteristics that I had and then the kinds of behaviors that I wanted to pursue when I was older, say within music or writing or just behavior um, on an everyday level that, that often these would be punished um, just because of my own subjectivity. Whereas I could see um, my kind of male peers or yeah, people different to me having this kind of behavior sanctioned or it being a given. So I think it was looking at why I'd felt so wrong for so long in my life, especially as a young, younger person. And then um, I think mainly through music, but also within translation practices and writing practices, just then getting into that, that feminist practice of questioning everything, questioning every negation, every instance of somebody um, shutting you down purely based on subjectivity and not those behaviours. Um, but it was also a chance for me very simply to return to those things that I loved as a child and not being embarrassed about writing about labyrinth, mm -hmm. not being embarrassed about, you know, because those are, those are also parts of shame. The older you get, you feel like you have to gravitate towards very serious subjects. You know, you should be writing about um, Greek tragedy. You shouldn't be writing about mm -hmm. labyrinth. Whereas there are there are connections between all these things as well, and they're all based on the same myths and the same stories. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's why. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, that makes complete sense, and I think in a way it sort of predicts my second question because clearly there's such a kind of importance placed in this book between being able to kind of move away from a particularly kind of female shame, as you've described, as part of a feminist project that it's important that of course you know power is important and equality is important as well but I kind of I'm fascinated by that sort of insistence that you have that it's also about being able to kind of stay with the discomfort of being that feels really important and there's another kind of fantastic quote where you're talking about your child self which you describe as furtive gooey twitchy alarming little goblin um, and that really kind of resonated with me and I think something else that sort of it brought to my attention is that idea that shame is also about a kind of physical sort of manifestation of what it might mean to be female and if you don't fit inside those particular parameters that 
can make life very difficult. Did you have a particular interest in talking about kind of bodily experience from, from a feminist perspective through the monstrous? Yeah, I think um, I've really avoided writing about, I think, my own kind of body and also about, say, sex. Like I find my, I find in a lot of my fiction and even poetry that I have, I've avoided for a really long time talking about um, things that are actually a very integral part of my own personality. And I think, um, yeah, particularly writing about myself as a child and talking about things like, um, particularly like body hair. So again, it's this thing of like, oh, it's such a frivolous thing to be talking about. But I tell you, it wasn't frivolous like growing up in a, in a kind of, um, you know, school environment or, you know, as a teenager where you, you're othered so extremely, you know, you become like the monster in the village um from really standing out and it's strange because you know I grew up in a very small town and I would say my family was one of the most kind of foreign looking families mm -hmm. which is really ridiculous when you move out of that small town you move to somewhere like London where it's um you know there's such a kind of variety of of being but it's yeah it's things like um you know when you inhabit those characteristics again that you're told are monstrous so this kind of uh, hairiness or darkness or having a kind of hypersexuality as well I think um, it was a chance to yeah look back at my younger self and feel almost very happy that I'd been othered in a particular way because it meant that I grew up um, being being used to that and understanding why that happens and that it's not something bad within yourself that it's something that is part of you and something you control and you can inhabit or choose not to inhabit mm. at any time so mm. yeah I think it's fascinating and I think it really resonated with me I mean you know you're of Maltese descent I'm of Hungarian descent definitely you know used to have kids who'd come and pull up my sleeves and say all oh, footballers arms because I had such dark black hair on my arms yeah. even at the age of what six seven yeah. you know and of course depending on where you're from that's unusual or not unusual but you know in Britain was more unusual so of course it gets really focused on and turned into this thing and I agree I think what was fascinating in your book is it also picks up on the fact that yes of course children pick up on difference and you know that can be a source of cruelty but there is also that more deep fear of a kind of um, female reality that goes outside of the boundaries I agree I think there's a sexual undercurrent to that even amongst children you know as you say and I think it's you know again it can be difficult to talk about that kind of thing because it can be perceived as shallow that it's it's about vanity somehow but of course you know as you describe so well in goblins it's also it's about a version of being and it's about the kind of person that you're able to be and the kind of versions of subjectivity that are available to you yeah and I think it's really uh played into my own thinking right now about um gender you know we're in a very critical moment at the moment about how um gender is being policed not only kind of legally but very much socially and I think, um, although, you know, on the, it might seem quite low level to think of, oh, you know, having um, grown up being othered for, say, having a lot of body hair and basically not fitting into the, the usual framework of what a woman should be or a girl, um, it's definitely also influenced my understanding of, um, you know, how it's these low level things are what, um, are, are triggers for gatekeepers around gender you know that's mm -hmm. it's another reason why um you know it's one part of the reason why i feel so strongly against um this kind of the policing of gender that we see right now because mm -hmm. in that little low level um i can completely understand it and i recognize that um that level of kind of basic bullying that happens you know it's it, and it takes such a little trigger for people to be set off around what a woman is and what a man is and, you know, it's like, it just takes me back to, yeah, being five and being kind of pinched and having, yeah, the hair and having to shave my arms, like, at the age of 10 so that you wouldn't get bullied. And it's, you know, it's writing in the book about the times when I've just, like, let it all go and how happy I feel now and how it's so much more part of me. You know, it's something I resented for such a long time. Mm -hmm. And then you realise that 
it doesn't matter or that it, it matters that it belongs to you and you can embrace it and that's that's all you know that's up to you and yeah it feels very empowering I feel so so happy that it's part of who I am and you know that changes over time and over your life as well of course but I, but I think yeah it's not even yeah but, but it's interesting what you're saying it's not you've not simply moved from something that was kind of painful to something that's neutral it's actually become a positive because there's that power obviously in kind of resisting those gender roles and there's that power in kind of embracing your goblinhood because I think what this book shows is you know goblinhood monstrousness it's not just about understanding the way that you're kind of resisted it's also about kind of engaging with the sort of inner powers and almost an animalistic power that sort of challenges what we expect from kind of you know female people or women identified people which is really really interesting I mean there's so so much to talk about I'm kind of you know aware that I need to race through but another thing that I was really interested in was the formal structure of the book because it moves sort of in this fascinating way it flows between these cultural instances of goblinness, so labyrinth or kind of other stories to reflections on your own experiences as a child, your experiences as a young woman making her way in music and as a translator. And all the threads seem to tie together very um, effectively. Where for you did this kind of innovative form come from? I think um, it was really difficult to find an arc to gather everything under. And I, uh, this, you know, this was maybe like, the fourth structure that I alighted mm -hmm. on so it was at one stage it was it was um it was kind of like speculative fiction I really I wanted there to only be um because I'm always thinking about the space of where writing is happening so for me it makes more sense that um you know that I should have been writing about the movies while sitting in a cinema you know that the, the, there's a physical space that you should be able to associate the writing being because I, I i sometimes obsess about you know where is this writing coming from it's just floating and who's talking about it and why where are they sitting um so there's a touch of that you know i'm talking i talk about like having the cinema screen where i'd have my viewings and i talk about an art gallery where all these different kind of baby sculptures live um and try and evoke space as much as possible but um, yeah, the earlier instance was was me kind of going through a kind of adventure land of all these of all these places that I talk about, but it was a bit too much and it got a bit too murky. So I wanted it to feel very clear, and I didn't want to do too 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 much quoting. But at the same time, there were these little gems that I felt um, really acted as a as a mirror and an enhancer of what I was talking about. Um, so the the grouping of the kind of goblin hood and the, the art goblins and then the kind of music aspect I guess it was just a, a, a more simple grouping there's overlaps obviously um, but it, it was a way of yeah clarifying um, it may be in a quite simplistic way of it being the kind of my childhood and then the art stuff and the music um, stuff but then you have the, the different subheadings which refer back to each other and it was just wonderful I think I was reading a Hilary Mantel quote about someone you know asking how she structures her work because it's so complex and she talked about um, how you have to just sit with the material for a long time and let the structure come to you and I, I you know I would never really hold to that until I was working on this where it was basically just I had all the material and suddenly it all started fitting into place and I could see all the connections that I hadn't even made before that were maybe obvious to other people but yeah that's how it came about mm, that's really really interesting and I think there is that real sense of synthesis in the text which kind of speaks to what you're describing that sense that it all came together with an element of kind of subconscious quality um on that kind of note of sort of how the book came together were there particular sort of literary influences that you were sort of aware of consciously as the book was being created? I mean, obviously some of them come up in the text itself, but I'm just curious whether you felt that there were particular voices or models for this text. Um, it has to be uh, Charlie Fox's This Young Monster. Um, I think, um, e even though I, I was very careful not to, I didn't reread that book before I wrote Goblins. Um, and it's not a kind of, there's, there's no real clear connection, but I think the way that he um, has, he writes about popular culture and, and especially the, the kinds of things that he 
um, read and watched when he was younger um, and has made into this, you know, incredibly powerful, um, insightful text. I think I was I was really inspired and that's what spurred me on because I think I had a, I really wanted to write this, but I thought this is just too silly. Like, why would I spend my time writing about these really childish things, these really niche things? You know, not everyone has watched and um, listened to the things that I talk about. And I think that really spurred me on because, you know, he he talks about things, again, that I haven't watched or listened to, but I felt like I wanted to go out there and find them because of the way he was writing about them. You know, and, and remembering that one of the nicest things is reading somebody writing about something that they they're passionate about and they're enthusiastic about and how that can really bring a lot of pleasure to writing it doesn't have to be something that everyone necessarily gets because they they've experienced it themselves or or um consumed that material but it's just nice reading about someone um talking about something they care about so i was like maybe that's enough maybe it's <laughs> fine if i care about it and if i write about um, these things maybe someone else will like it and I feel like that that has happened thankfully it's been so nice people reading it and there being like one section or, or a whole um, part of it that they've said yes that's me and I'm so glad mm -hmm. I got to read this and you know that's just like incredible that's an incredible feeling yeah absolutely that makes complete sense and I can I can really see those resonances kind of at work um so obviously something else that really interested me in the book is that it's very interdisciplinary. It's moving between film, television, literature, visual art, um, and also music. And so I was just kind of wondering, can you sort of compare for us the experience of creating a book like this, uh, which obviously you're kind of doing a lot of research, you're writing it on your own and performing in a band. Does one or the other kind of bring out your inner goblin more potently or do they both bring it out, but in different ways? That's a really good question. Um, I think, yeah, that's really, really tricky. I think, you know, writing for me um, has always been like, you know, I want to say like goblin of the mind. You know, when, when you start writing very young and you know what it's like when you you allow yourself to really go deep and you're like in your mind and you're exploring these different tunnels of a subject. Um, and, it, and that in itself feels very radical every time. And it feels like you're doing, you're misbehaving somehow because you're not just functioning in the real world. You're going down this hole in your, in your head and that's scary. And I think that does take a bit of a kind of goblin attitude to, to say, kind of fuck it I'm, I'm going down there and then with with bands I think um it for me it takes it takes a, co a goblin attitude to be in a band because I'm I'm a natural introvert and it's something that people find difficult sometimes when when you know that idea of like well how can you be an introvert but you get you can get on stage and you can shout on people's faces mm. um and I think I think it comes from this idea of, well, if I don't do it, then maybe someone else won't feel like they can do it. So for me, it always comes from this place of, I have to be a goblin by example, because there might be a better goblin that might feel empowered by seeing this slimy thing kind of like on mm. stage, if that makes sense. Yeah, it completely, it completely does. And also, you know, in some ways, what's more goblin I suppose than an introvert kind of getting up and on stage and kind of showing their inner passion sexuality darkness whatever that song is like bringing in that particular moment that it doesn't just have to be someone who's sort of completely in love with themselves and confident at all times mm -hmm. that it can be someone who has a different kind of self-love which is inner and you know not necessarily all about um, showing a particular face to the world. I think that makes complete sense. We only have time for one more question, but I just want to kind of follow up from that. Obviously your kind of other work is as a literary translator. And I was wondering what your relationship is, and you do touch on it in the text, but what your relationship is between goblinhood and translation. Is, is there a version of goblinhood that comes out in that kind of interaction where you're working with another author's writing? Oh, um... I think the first thing that comes to mind is uh, being a translator, 
you physically become a goblin in the sense that you become a complete hermit and again you you're kind of forced into this um this world where you have to be completely submerged like you're in a mud bath in this text and you know you're you you become you become like a creature it's really difficult because it's you can get that with writing as well but i think um what's what's so strange about translation is you you become attached to this text and you know like even this morning i was translating and you i have this book open on a stand i'm just gazing into this text um you know like a like a goblin looking into a pool. Hmm. and um you become obsessed with it you're like Gollum and the ring you're like all you think about is this text um so I think that's what it makes me think of it, it makes me think of allowing yourself to um be entranced by something completely and it's a you know it's different to reading a book I think it's you know it's like I'm gonna have to consume this and I'm gonna have to regurgitate it um for other people so it's um yeah there's like a sliminess about it I was writing about um I'm writing a book about uh translation at the moment and um this idea you know some people find translation reading translations a bit icky almost like they don't want to um, eat regurgitated food like they don't like this idea that somebody has been touching it and um, manipulating it um and yeah regurgitating it I think that's a I'm going to leave leave that to be the word for it. Yeah, that's a great place to finish. Yeah, and and I and I think that makes complete sense that I the recognition that there is no pure text, mm -hmm. that there is no kind of pure genius and pure kind of author intention, and recognizing that kind of complication is hard. And I think your book is very interested in recognizing the kind of complication and the impurity of all texts, yeah, um, the grubbiness of all these things. I think grubby. Yeah. Yeah. yeah dirty in a satisfying way yeah um that's a good place to end jen thank you so much and yeah congratulations again on a fantastic exciting book oh thank you so much it's been a real pleasure it's been a pleasure thank you thank you